Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, Lahedi Johnson is my name. I am an ordinary Australian. I am somebody's daughter. I'm somebody's wife. I'm two beautiful girls' mother, and I'm a little girl's grandmother. And I guess my story tells you how ordinary lives, any one of your lives, can change. And my ordinary life changed when my seven-year-old daughter, or our seven-year-old daughter, um, disclosed that she was being sexually assaulted. Um, our life changed forever. Before that, I was involved in business, I was involved in politics. My life stopped. Now, I'm not sure if any of you have looked through a kaleidoscope and you see there's no up, there's no down, there's no left, there's no right, there's nothing to hang on to. You don't know what to trust, what to believe in anymore. The person that offended against our daughter was my husband's father. This was a man that we totally adored and totally trusted. I used to say to my husband, I hope when you're his age that you're just like him. And uh, as I found out later, this is pretty common. She, uh, my husband and my daughter were on holidays in New Zealand visiting his family. I was here busy. I was working. I was doing what I do best, and that is just blinkers on, doing a job. I was, work I was running a political campaign or involved in one. So I said to my husband, why don't you go to New Zealand, take Kayleen, go and visit your family, go and have some fun, and then I can selfishly, I don't have to cook clean, all of that stuff, and I can just do what I do. Um, so that was great, and, and uh, he said he would do that. It was bedtime the very first night. Actually, before I get to that, I'll tell you that at the, at the airport, if you've been to the international airport, you know the escalators go down. Um, my husband was carrying our daughter against his chest, going down the escalators, and I was standing at the top because I dropped them off, and our little seven-year-old then was a little arms up in the air going, Mummy, Mummy, Mummy. And she was crying. She was so upset, and I thought, something is wrong. No, 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 it's not wrong, it's just, she's, it's just separation issues, she'll be fine. Um, but she knew what she was going back to, I didn't. And that's a memory that I'll carry for the rest of my life. When my husband got to New Zealand, um, the whole family in New Zealand had come to visit and say hello to the, to the, you know, the son and the, the, the brother and the cousin, etc. that they hadn't seen for some time. And then it was bedtime. And Poppy had made Kayleen her own special bed in her own little room now because he said she was old enough now. She didn't have to sleep with mummy or daddy or just daddy or in their room. She could have her own bed. And she wasn't at all interested. She didn't want to go there. So she put on a bit of a performance, a lot of a performance, to the point that my husband thought something is wrong here. So to his absolute credit, he took her and he said, you don't have to sleep in there if you don't want to. You come and sleep with me. Calmed it down, lied down with her, rubbed her back. What's wrong? I'm scared. What are you scared of? I'm scared of Poppy. Why are you scared of Poppy? Because Poppy touches me. And my husband froze because he knew what was going to come next. Where does he touch you? He touches me here. And his life changed too because at that point he had to make a choice. He was either going to protect his father and keep this secret or he was going to protect his daughter and tell me. And he knew what would happen if he told me. <laughs> I'm not known for my silence. Yes. So. Um, to his credit, and because he is the most beautiful man God ever put on the planet, um, <laughs> he married me. No, just kidding. <laughs> he told me, and he put his daughter first. Now, that is remarkable in itself because too often that doesn't happen. So from there, I stand here. From there, we went to the police. Um, he went to jail. We went to counselling. In fact, when it happened and he was in New Zealand and I was in Australia, I had never, I just didn't, this isn't something that had ever touched my life and I didn't think it would. Can I tell you, I thought it didn't happen to families like ours. Not good, solid, white, suburban, picket fence type families. This happened to somebody else, not us. I didn't know what to do. I just didn't know what to do. A couple of doctors came over, threw some tablets at me and just put me, knocked me out. <laughs> it's the only thing I could cope with was I just, I just had to get out of my own head because I didn't have an answer. Um, but they didn't work very well and I woke up fairly shortly thereafter and it was the middle of the night by then I got on the net to find out what is this thing called child sexual assault? Who does this to children and why? What do I do next? How do I deal with this? I've got my husband and my daughter in absolute crisis thousands of miles away. I can't pick her up. I can't hold her. 
I can't tell my husband it's okay. And worse, I can't give them any kind of clue as to what to do next because I don't know. So we're all in a state of turmoil. I get on the net. I look at this thing, child sexual abuse. Woomfa fills the screen with the most disgusting, horrible, um, appalling statistics. And I thought, how did I have two children and nobody tells me this? How did somebody, somebody not tell me, one in five children, roughly, are sexually assaulted before they turn 18? One in five, 20% of the population. In Australia, that's 59,000 children every year. 59,000 children more than could fit in most of our football stadiums. Millions of children across the world. And we were doing nothing. We weren't even talking about it. We didn't have the courage to say the words, let alone respond to it. So I had a ballot paper, which, as you know, those who voted in Australia, is about as long as toilet paper. And I pulled it out and I started writing down all of these numbers on the back of this piece of paper about who I was going to call the moment the sun came up, who I was emailing, where I was going to get the to-do list, what to do, what not to do, who to trust, who to talk to, what am I going to do? How do I fix this? Oh. Questions, questions. The sun came up. I picked up the phone and I rang those numbers and there was not an agency in this country anywhere that dealt specifically with child sexual assault. Nobody was there. Nobody could tell me what to do. I finished up getting my answer out of the Wellington Rape Crisis Centre in New Zealand. Um, and that's how my family came home. And because we had the financial resources we were able to then follow that up and find a professional counsellor who knew what they were doing to help us, to help my daughter and my husband and myself and my, other, and my older daughter. This was the situation in Australia. So right then I thought, right, once we're finished with this, we've got to fix this. And that's how Brave Hearts was born, out of the suffering, I suppose, and the trauma of, of our family. Those statistics are horrible. And, can, and that was 16 years ago. By the way, she's 24 now and she's absolutely wonderful, empowered young woman. At that time, though, the laws were different. No one wanted to talk about it. We didn't want to do anything. We just didn't do anything. And, and so I started organising Brave, Brave Hearts. We started White Balloon Day out of the situation in Belgium when 300,000 people came together in 1996, same year, with white balloons to demonstrate intolerance against child sexual assault. And I'll remember forever, the little older lady that was walking past me and I was handing out balloons and she said, oh, yes, thank you, darling, I'll have one of those. And she said, what's it for, what's it for? And I said, well, that's to demonstrate against child sexual assault. She went, oh, no, 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 don't, don't want one of those. <laughs> True, and she gave it back to me. We've come a long way since then. We have come a long way since then. Um, the the organisation that I'm involved in, Brave Hearts, does education. It does counselling. It does awareness. It does all sorts of things, but it's been a long ride because people don't want to engage in this issue. Even last night um, at an event that I was at, we were talking about, and what do you do, Hetty? Well, I, I run an organisation that deals with child sexual assault. Oh, and what do you do? Uh, the conversation moved on very quickly. Um, so it's, it's it. In Australia and across the Western world, there are millions of children, black, white, pink, purple, all different cultures, all different religions, different socioeconomics everywhere. This evil is not, doesn't discriminate. It affects each and every one of you. Each and every one of you in this room, each and every person listening, hearing this, is going to be touched by this issue in some way. You cannot miss when you're talking about 20% of the population. How can we, as adults, the only people that can reach out and protect our children, all of us, how can we continue to turn our back on these kids? How can we continue to turn our back on those kids that become adults that need our help? Those children that are committing suicide, that are doing drugs and alcohol, finding themselves in the gutter with a syringe up their arm. Those children that are filling our courtrooms and our prisons, all of them. Sexual confusion, sexual dysfunction, family breakdown, you know, drugs, alcohol, the whole lot. And what do we do? Too hard, sorry, can't deal with it. How do we as a society hold our heads up high? Any one of us. I can't understand it. It just does my head in. Once you understand this issue and you know how simple it is to take this on and change it because you are the voice. You're the voice. In this room, every single adult that breathes on this planet 
is a voice that can change this, is a voice that can rescue these children. Now, we're never going to wipe out child sexual assault. I don't suspect that we will. But we can reduce it to the most minimal margins if we decide to. If we vote, if we make our politicians aware, we want this fixed. You're the voice. You're the voice that can do that. Give the politicians the voice. They stand up in Parliament, as they've just done here in Australia. Hallelujah. And said, we're going to have a Federal Royal Commission. Braveheart's mission is to make Australia the safest place in the world to raise a child. That's my personal goal for my time in this, in this area or on this planet. And I thought it would be a, a longer-term goal than it's now appearing. To that vein, we conducted some research. We called it the Three Peers, strong platform to make Australia the safest place in the world to raise a child. And we, with researchers and, and um, criminologists, have mapped out how we do that. We've mapped, this is not a whimsical dream. This is not something that's aspirational, that I oh, wouldn't be world peace, wonderful. This can happen. You can make this happen. Adults can make this happen. Believe it. Do you believe me? Yes. You can. You come together. You can protect children. Survivors who come to us, the many, many thousands of survivors that have come to Brave Hearts over the years, don't come to us out of vengeance or vindictiveness or, or whatever. They don't go to police for that reason either. They go because they want their experience to stop these, these offenders from harming other children. They go because they, they want their experience to mean something to the next generation so that more children don't get harmed. One in five people in this room know exactly what I'm talking about. You're the voice. Break the silence. The silence, the secrecy and the shame, those three S's, are the pedophile's best friend and all of our children's very worst enemy. We have to break the silence. We have to do it globally because we've got a global financial crisis. We've got a global warming crisis. But ladies and gentlemen, we've also got a global child protection crisis. And it's about time we started paying it as much attention and throwing as much money at it and as political will about it um, as we do the rest of it. As I said, in Australia, we're now having our Federal Royal Commission. Hopefully it doesn't get derailed by those that would rather we don't have it. I think that in Australia we're finally going to open the dialogue. I'm excited. I'm so excited. I can't begin to tell you how excited I am because it's permission to speak. We're going to talk about it. We're going to understand that people who have been harmed in this way are normal, everyday people. They're not strange. They're not damaged because of, you know, they, they are normal people. They're struggling. What damages them? Like when, when at all, in the very beginning for me, I was told, don't tell anybody. Shh. The law said to me, in fact, the, the government said to me, be quiet, you're breaking the law. You cannot speak, you cannot stand up as a mother of a child who's been sexually assaulted because in doing so that leads to the identity of your child and we can't have that because she's vulnerable now. We know this about children who've been harmed. They're vulnerable. More harm will come to them if people know who they are. Ladies and gentlemen, that's just bollocks, okay? What makes those children vulnerable is the secret, the three S's, the silence, the secrecy and the shame. We need to empower those children by giving them their voice, not taking it away. We don't say to them, shh, be quiet, don't tell anybody, shh. We do that, and if I wasn't going to do that, I can tell you. <laughs> I didn't do that. We changed the law here in Queensland. <laughs> I wasn't going to do that. <laughs> yes. Because the moment you do that, the moment you do that, you say to your child, what you're doing is you're putting a ball and chain around their ankle that says, what happened to you makes you somehow less, less, less perfect, less innocent, less beautiful, less something, dirty, damaged, something. No, she's not. When she spoke out, her poppy had been sexually offended in every female member of that family practically for 40 years, two generations, nobody ever said a word until this very beautiful, gorgeous, trusting seven-year-old told her daddy. I'm not ashamed of that, and I never will be. I am so proud of her. But yes. Yes. 
Thank you. I hope she can hear that. I'll make sure she watches this. <laughs> and my husband, I'm so proud of him because he had, he had the decision to make and he made it in favour of our daughter, of myself, of my family, of my friends, of the wonderful, wonderful supporters of Bravehearts who, when this issue was just so taboo and no one wanted to talk about it, stood next to me. Stood next to me when I was taking on Governor Generals and taking on entire government departments and, and just taking on anybody who would dare to put their best interests above the best interests of our children. Ladies and gentlemen, I think Australia is on the cusp of becoming, in terms of child sexual assault, the safest nation in the world to raise a child. I'm really proud to be an Australian. I hope that this Royal Commission brings with it everything I dream of. I hope that the outcomes reflect our three peers uh, research because if it does, then we will have done this properly. We're not going to get this um, chance again. History will judge us. Um, you're the voice. Please back us in this. Back children for the next five generations around the world. Do the same thing. Get behind our children because they are the future. Thank you.